Okay. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, to those faithful few on a Sunday and a beautiful day in Washington to, to come here. So thank you uh, very much for coming. I hope we'll, we will make it worth your while. Uh, my name is Paul Spiegel, and I'm a, uh, the director at the Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health. And it's my pleasure to, um, to really be able to present something that's very dear to many of our hearts. And I would like to thank CGUH for, um, for having us and for allowing this topic to come on to their agenda. So I, what, what, the way we're going to do this, and I hope we'll keep it informal, is that we have three presentations with um, three very excellent people who will be able to provide different aspects of what I hope will be uh, a broad discussion about humanitarian emergencies from the global to Syria through famine. Um, and I've asked each of, the, each of the presenters also, though, to speak a little bit about what they would like to see in terms of future humanitarian health workers. What, what do they think as, as educators, as trainers, as we as educators or trainers need to do differently and perhaps uh, better? Um, so then, and then I will have a small, uh, after they speak, I'm going to add a little bit more uh, just on my side about, um, I spent the last many years with the United Nations and I've just joined Hopkins eight months ago. So some of my thoughts about education as well of uh, future humanitarian health workers. And then we'll be opening it up for questions, comments. Um, there was a lot to talk about given, given where we are in the world right now. So each will have 15 minutes, the speakers, but I will introduce them all right now. And so I'll start with uh, Dr. Rick Brennan. And Rick is the Director of Emergency Operations at the World Health Organization, or WHO, in the New Emergencies Program. He's based in Geneva and oversees support to WHO's response to health emergencies globally. The new program brings together several departments in WHO to streamline the organization's role in emergencies from prevention and preparedness to response and from humanitarian emergencies to disease outbreaks. Um, Rick is one of my old dear friends. We, we did our MPH together 20 years ago, actually at Hopkins. And since then, he's had an illustrious career with International Rescue Committee, spending a long time in Liberia to help with their uh, systems reconstruction, and then intimately involved at the global level, leading the global level for health and humanitarian emergencies. After uh, Rick speaks, we have, uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Samer Jabour, who is a co-chair and convener of the Lancet AUB, American University of Beirut Commission on Syria, uh, and that's called Health in Conflict. And that, uh, Samer will talk to you a little bit about that. He pursues dual work in public health as an associate professor of practice in the Faculty of Health Sciences at AUB, and is also, and this is one of the few, I think, in our field that actually continues to practice medicine clinically as a cardiologist um, here in the US. As a specialist in non-communicable diseases, he served as director of the Department of NCDs and Mental Health at the WHO Regional Office in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, in Egypt itself, between 2013 and 2015. And the last speaker is Chris Hilbrunner, and he is actually working with a group that is, is, does exceptional work specifically on food security and famine. So he's the famine, he's the deputy chief of party for the, what's called FUSENET, the Famine Early Warning System Network. Um, he has led the FUSENET's early warning analysis since 2009 and currently oversees the project's technical centers. And he regularly presents FUSENET's um, presents FUSENET's latest security and food analysis data to a range of US uh, partners. Given what's happening in, uh, across the world right now in terms of food security and how famine, just mentioning the word famine, can be very, very political, Chris is going to discuss this and, and explain to us even how famine can be declared and also some of the big issues that are occurring currently. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Rick Brennan for the first presentation. Thanks a lot, Paul, and uh, great to be here. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. And uh, great to see some, some old friends here uh, in the audience today. So what I, I thought I might try to do as, as the first speaker is, is perhaps try to give you 
an overlying framework of the scale of risk and need globally as it re relates to hum humanitarian health emergencies uh, and, uh, and outbreaks. I'm going to have a reasonably broad definition. And then briefly introduce uh, some of the global initiatives that, are, that have developed over the last couple of years to try and take on and tackle that, that broad frame of uh, risk and need. And then touch on very briefly at the end what I see as the role of academic institutions in contributing to the, the global response. So you only have to turn on the television or pick up a newspaper to understand that the world is in a bit of a tough place right now. The scale of humanitarian need and risk is at an all-time high. Uh, globally today, there's 130 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, and that is the highest ever documented. Uh, in addition, uh, there are 65, over 65 million people who have been forcibly displaced from their homes. And again, that's the, probably the highest on record, certainly the highest ever since the end of the Second World War. 85% of that humanitarian need is driven by conflict, uh, but also uh, to a degree from, but from food security crises and, um, and other natural disasters. Um, that's, that's the protracted level. In addition, there are over 200 epidemics that are picked up globally by our global uh, event-based surveillance. Uh, most prominently, we've, in, in recent years, we've seen large outbreaks of new emerging and re-emerging diseases such as SARS and H1N1, MERS in the Middle East, Ebola and Zika. Uh, but what we sometimes forget is, in recent years also, there's been an escalation in the number and scale of cholera outbreaks and indeed in yellow fever as well. So this is part of our global landscape that we have to tackle also. In addition, every year there's 200 million people affected by sudden onset disasters and technological emergencies. Um, for example, a couple of days ago, we had an earthquake in, in the Philippines. Right now, there's a cyclone heading towards uh, New Caledonia. So as you can see, large, large scale of risk and need. And give you a sense of how this, uh, this situation is evolving and worsening. What I've mapped out here is the number of large-scale emergencies by year uh, over the last decade or so. Uh, in, in the last seven or eight years, the, the global humanitarian system has started grading emergencies, and, and each agency, each of the big UN humanitarian agencies has our own internal grading system. And we have grades one, two, and three. A grade three emergency is all hands on deck. You've got to mobilize every resource that you have across the organization to assist the affected country. And when the grading system was developed uh, about seven or eight years ago, collectively, humanitarian agencies figured there'd probably be one grade three emergency every couple of years. And if you look at the first decade of, of, the, of the century, if we look retrospectively, even before this grading system was developed, there were probably about four grade three emergencies. Uh, back in 2004, 2005, we had the Asian tsunami, then we had the Pakistan earthquake, uh, and then in 2010, we had the, uh, the Pakistan floods and the, and the Haiti earthquake. They were the big, uh, the big grade three emergencies of the previous decade. Fast forward a couple of years, and the situation has worsened substantially. We, um, at one point, uh, back in 2015, WHO was responding to seven grade three emergencies at one time, including Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Central African Republic, South Sudan, the Ebola outbreak uh, in, in West Africa. And what, so this is unprecedented to have this level of, 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 of need and having your limited resources stretched over such a, a broad geographic area with incredibly complex operational environments. Uh, what this doesn't capture is that some of those grade three emergencies are multi-country. So those seven grade three emergencies affected 12 countries. Syria is a sub-regional emergency because of, of the impact on Lebanon and, uh, and Jordan, and, and indeed Turkey. The, uh, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was a sub-regional multi-emergency, uh, multi-country emergency. We had 72 operational field sites in the Ebola response. So this is a huge demand on the resources uh, of, of any given agency. Uh, and this gives you a sense. Outbreaks, a huge dimension of this, and an increasingly important dimension. Uh, over the last six years, again, over 1,200 uh, significant outbreaks 
you know, across all the big disease, uh, uh, epidemic prone diseases. So for us right now, again, my organization has never had such demands placed on it. Today, we're responding to 50 emergencies globally, including slow onset, sudden, uh, slow onset natural disasters, sudden onset natural disasters, outbreaks, and about 80 to 85% of what we're doing right now is conflict related. And you can see a big concentration of our work in Africa and the Middle East. And the less encouraging news is it's not gonna get any better anytime soon. The drivers of risk are, um, are worsening the situation from climate change to emerging infectious diseases, state fragility. There are 38 countries that are ranked on, on the state fragility in index. Migration, demographic shifts, urbanization, and so on. All of these developments suggest that um, the, you know, the, the situation, like the, the framing that, I, that I've presented, is not going to get any better anytime soon. If you look at the average time that a, that a refugee or an internally displaced person is forced from their homes, it's seven years. The, the, many of the conflicts that we're dealing with today with their enormous levels of humanitarian need are multi-year events. In Congo, we've been responding to humanitarian need for 21 years. The conflict in, in Somalia has been going on for 26 years uh, with the associated food insecurity. Uh, pre-famine situations, major outbreaks, and so on. Again, complex uh, operating environments. In this context, it's, it's important to see the, the convergence of, of, of different agendas. There was a lot of concern after the Ebola outbreak that the world was not ready for the next big global pandemic. And we're, you know, as many of you are aware, there's a lot of concern about, are we ready for the next time a major flu pandemic uh, hits? And Ebola was kind of a test case for the global capacities to respond, and we, we came up short. Um, but what we're finding now is at, as the risks for, for major outbreaks and pandemics expands, and, and the, the scale of humanitarian need on the basis of conflict and even natural disasters also expands, we're seeing a convergence of these different agendas. The health security agenda and the humanitarian agenda have really been driven uh, by two different constituencies globally. But we've got to bring this together more holistically because what we're finding is major outbreaks become humanitarian emergencies, as we saw with Ebola. And major uh, humanitarian emergencies are frequently, and I would contend increasingly, uh, complicated by big outbreaks. As we're seeing in Somalia today, the major cause of death in Somalia with the pre-famine is actually the cholera outbreak and it may soon be overtaken by measles as the major cause of mortality. We have major cholera outbreaks, again, on the back, the back of famine and pre-famine in South Sudan right now, Ethiopia and elsewhere. The other issue is uh, this, this growing scale of humanitarian crises is a major, major risk, particularly the fragile states to the achievement of the Sustainable de Development Goals. Of the eight countries in the world with the highest child mortality, my organization has big emergency programs in eight of them. Uh, similarly, the, the nine countries in the world with the highest maternal mortality, we have big emergency operations in, in, in those. We're not going to be able to meet the sustainable development goals unless we get on top of, of this situation and work more effectively uh, in, uh, in, in fragile states in particular, but also to address these other risks. It can be very expensive. So this year, every year, as you may be aware, the international humanitarian system comes together with what we call humanitarian response plans for the big ongoing humanitarian emergencies. And for the 32 odd uh, humanitarian response plans that have been developed globally, the, the budget, the collective budget for that this year is $21.6 billion, um, which sounds like a lot of money. And to date, here we are, middle of April, we've only been funded at 17.3%. So we're overstretched operationally and we are grossly underfunded to respond to the needs that I've described. Put that in perspective, um, the hard power budget that's been announced by, uh, by the current uh, American administration has increased defense spending by $52 billion, and the 2018 budget for the US Department of Defense will be $639 billion. A 
global humanitarian system is asking for 3.3% of that total to address the huge scale of need. We have respond effectively now to the, the, the multiple famine and pre-famine scenarios. We will save more lives this year than perhaps any other humanitarian action in recent years. But we are grossly under-resourced to do our job. Natural disasters um, are estimated to cost $160 billion a year. That's primarily on the basis of destruction of infrastructure, particularly in developed countries. A big pandemic, uh, the World Bank estimates, could cost as much as $3 trillion. So there's a real requirement for us to invest not only in response, but very much in prevention and preparedness and, and local capacities. So it's all very well to talk about um, uh, the data, and it, and it can be really disturbing and, and a, a wake-up call. But ultimately, uh, it's always about the people. Uh, and you can walk into any disaster-affected community and be incredibly moved by the stories of the individuals and inspired by, by their work. The resilience of, 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 of mothers in the most difficult circumstances, be it Eastern Congo, be it Aleppo, uh, be, it, uh, be it South Sudan uh, as well. So the incredible resilience, but also the incredible work done. Um, we're going to he hear from Samir later. And for me, some of the greatest heroes I've met in recent years are the amazing health workers, uh, Syrian health workers who've provided extraordinary services uh, to their people under the most unbelievably difficult operating environments. So we talk a lot about the da data, but we can't, uh, we can't forget the human dimension uh, to, to these, uh, these issues and these situations. So it's a tough world out there, uh, but there's good news. Uh, and there are, it, all these developments have forced us to collectively to step back and really analyze how we're working and what we're doing and how we can be more effi effective, efficient, and collective in, 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 our, in our preparedness and response. And there are, as I said before, there are a lot of different constituencies looking at different pieces of this. Last year, we had the World Humanitarian Summit where the humanitarian agencies, those primarily working in, in conflict situations, but nat natural disasters as well, came together, and, and from that we developed the Agenda for Humanity, uh, uh, an overarching strategic framework with big responsibilities and commitments to improve our work in humanitarian action. The year before, we had the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. Again, primarily the disaster risk reduction world coming together, those who work mainly in, in natural disasters coming together and, and saying, how can we invest better to reduce the risks and, and the burdens that, that disasters place on communities? And then on the back of, um, uh, of the Ebola outbreak, we've had what's called the Global Health Security Agenda. Again, a collective international approach to saying, how can we better prevent, prepare for, uh, detect, and respond to, to, to major outbreaks? The convergence of the work being done across these different types of emergencies by these different constituencies is absolutely vital if we want to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals. So there's a lot of good work being out, done out there, but we've got to get our arms around, conceptually around, how we can come together more cohesively and collectively uh, to, to address um, uh, the landscape that, that I've described. So some of the main themes that have come out of those global initiatives, where these do converge, it's all about reducing need, uh, investing in prevention and preparedness, uh, managing risk, uh, looking at um, local capacities, local vulnerabilities, um, ensuring that we have early, good early warning and early action mechanisms, and you'll be hearing more about that from Chris in a few moments. Strengthening local and regional capacities. Tremendous work being done on this in, uh, in the Asia Pacific region and the Americas, and a lot for us to learn globally about how countries, the Philippines, the, uh, Nepal, have invested in their national capacities and developed regional mechanisms with their partners that, can, that, that are resulting in more eff effective and efficient responses. And professionalizing our emergency action. Gone are the days where you know, well-meaning guys should just jump on a plane and go, go to help. There is a science and a practice to, uh, to emergency action. And I mentioned before the different constituencies, those of us who've worked primarily in a conflict-based setting, we're learning a lot from the guys who've worked in civil defense and natural disasters about what strong emergency management really is about. And to that end, uh, in the health sector, we're, we're moving to, to, to support countries develop what are called public health emergency operations centers, where governments are capacitated to manage the risks and the response to emergencies globally. 
and there's a lot of good progress being done uh, in that area. In fact, there are uh, there's an initiative right now to develop 70 of these emergency operation centers in ministries of health globally. So, you know, some of the, the big areas around humanitarian action, around um, the, uh, the agenda for humanity and what's called the grand bargain, I think, again, this localization and regionalization of aid. Uh, really important lessons to be learned about that, uh, and we could you know, maybe pick up on this, that in the discussion. The other big area is around what, what's being increasingly referred to as the humanitarian development nexus. In these protracted conflicts, we too often ad adopt the short-term humanitarian approach that doesn't lay a foundation for longer-term recovery. But the classic humanitarian uh, approach doesn't work particularly effectively in that environment, nor do the classic developmental approaches. So a lot of work being done now on how the humanitarian actors and the development actors can come together with uh, joint assessments, joint planning, joint analysis, and joint monitoring and evaluation. So we really can leverage the capacities of both, both worlds uh, to the benefit of, of, of the affected populations. Use of cash, uh, I, I won't get into that. Paul may have something to say about this, but an, another exciting new development uh, in, in, uh, in emergency action. So um, I hope I've given you a sense of the scale of risk and need, some of the big initiatives that are, take, uh, that are taking on that and, and, and some of the thinking behind some of those initiatives. So where do the, where do the academic institutions uh, fit in here? My view is you guys aren't keeping up. We need, we need to leverage your incredible capacities more. We need it particularly the way that you develop your students for future engagement in humanitarian uh, response. I'm conscious of the fact that I've taken up to, uh, already probably my, my 15 minutes, but the one point I would make, uh, for 10 years I was the director of uh, the International Rescue Committee's health unit, and we, uh, we, we had partnerships with four or five major academic institutions here in the United States that had humanitarian health programs. And we took their students, we took their fellows, and deployed them in humanitarian responses. I thought this was gonna be the pipeline, the next generation of humanitarian health workers. Worked on this for many years. To, to my knowledge, of all the fellows that we took, only one of them has ever gone on to a career in humanitarian action, a full-time career. So I really do think that uh, as we think about the big needs out there, the big gaps in resources, uh, the academic institutions have to play an important role in helping us develop the, that pipeline, develop the, the new generation of humanitarian health professionals. And of course, the great resources that you have on research, make sure your research is operationally focused. We've got enough assessments. We need to know what works in the field. We also need much more constructive and operationally focused contributions in, um, uh, in the policy dialogues. Because I fear, being an operational guy, uh, I, I, I really do feel that the, the academic institutions are not serving the humanitarian world adequately right now. There are some exceptions, but we need you to do more. I'm happy to pick up on that dis conversation during the uh, discussions later. Thanks a lot. Hello everyone, um, uh, let me turn the, uh, the timer here. Um, uh, uh, many thanks to, uh, to Paul for bringing me to this, uh, to this conference uh, and particularly to this uh, 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 session and to uh, CUGH for, uh, for actually flying me over here. Um, I'm uh, going to build on uh, Rick's presentation to take a case study of the Syria example and extend some of the um, uh, uh, concept presented regarding the role of, of academia. Um, uh, please excuse the fact that this is actually work in progress and uh, I uh, revised my presentation yesterday to, uh, to, to, uh, to follow a line of thinking about what is the role of academic uh, global health in response to a particularly political uh, uh, crisis. So, um, um, uh, this work started actually 
uh, in collaboration uh, with the Lancet, uh, uh, when we looked uh, in the context of the Arab uprisings about the changing uh, public health profile in our region, and we did a series on health in the, uh, in the Arab world that included actually a, um, a very interesting article by, uh, by a uh, colleague, Omar Deoji, who's, uh, who's actually an anthropologist, that I hope you have a chance to read because it's, it really um, started examining in the context of the uh, 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 Syria and Iraqi wars, uh, how um, uh, health systems are dismantled uh, nationally and reinvented regionally. Uh, that's the concept of the therapeutic geographies. But then the Syria crisis blown up in the interim while this work was being done, and this actually um, uh, led us to launch the Lancet uh, AUB Commission on Syria, uh, whose work I'm going to, and approaches I'm going to use as a, as a case study here. And what, what we have hoped to do uh, through, uh, through the, um, a, a multidisciplinary talented commission that includes uh, Paul Spiegel and, uh, and other colleagues um, is to look at the, uh, the burden of war, um, uh, look at the international response to the crisis, uh, develop policy options, and actually come together in an international network that looks at the broader issues building on the Syria example the broader issues uh, specifically related to, uh, to conflict uh, and health. And uh, uh, invite you all to, v to visit the website and get in touch if you feel that this is of, uh, of interest to you. And um, extending the, the presentation that uh, Rick made with regards to the role of, uh, of, uh, of academic global health, it seems to me that one of the ideas, uh, one of the, uh, the crucial roles in which we are in, in academic global health is in the business of creating ideas um, and reformulating ideas, extending the, uh, the work on the research. So obviously the research that, uh, generates the important evidence, but we also have to, uh, uh, to, uh, to propose new ideas. And what I'd like to propose to you is that, um, is that the reframing of every political uh, conflict that we are uh, entering is one key subject for, uh, for academic global health, and in fact, for global health in, in general. Every place we go um, uh, is that these issues, uh, they're in the media every day, uh, they're in print every day, they're in day-to-day -day discussions about this serious subject. And what's really important is that is that, um, is that we don't necessarily, in global health, need to refrain from a political discussion. We enter it every day in our daily lives. So uh, uh, we need to be in that business of looking at the reframing of a lot of what is taken for granted uh, uh, with regards to a concept of, of, in, of political conflict and rethink about what they mean in uh, any particular conflict. So, for example, if you take the Syria example, is that you know we are discussing an international conflict, but it's actually um, uh, what's perhaps really useful to to, uh, uh, to examine is the crisis of the international system of governance that is a contributed uh, contributed to uh, contributing to an international conflict. And uh, the failure of the responsibility to protect, a, a, it is a UN doctrine that has actually been abandoned as demonstrated uh, very vividly through the uh, Syria uh, crisis. So, um, um, so this has given rise to uh, what many of us Syrians will, will now call the Syria question. Uh, so, um, so uh, uh, extending the discussion of Syria as a humanitarian emergency, as uh, Rick brilliantly uh, outlined as part of many, to actually uh, discussing Syria as a Syria question that has a whole set of issues attached to it, summarized in the in the previous uh, uh, the previous slide. And actually, some of our commissioners are already looking at this. Uh, in this, there's a, uh, there's a uh, publication that's uh, coming out this, uh, this fall here. I encourage some of you to look at this. There are some publications already in, uh, in French on the subject, and some obviously in the art. Now, if we, if we go specifically into, uh, into our core agenda, um, what is it that we do in global health and in, in humanitarian work, there are also a set of issues that need, uh, need, uh, um, uh, need reframing. Um, 
So um, uh, take the subject of the um, of refugees. This is on the news every day. And um, when we discuss the refugees, uh, there is less discussion of where this connects as part of the, um, the strategy of ethnic cleansing that's used on a daily basis in Syria. And the li latest example comes from Homs. Um, how the subject is really not a global crisis. It remains primarily a regional crisis. The global dimension um, is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is discussed, but the regional uh, implications are far more, uh, more, uh, more important. What, what, are the, uh, what is the, uh, uh, the political economy of the numbers of refugees um, uh, that are listed on record, displayed, but actually um, have, uh, uh, have some questions around them relates to, uh, uh, to, to agendas of countries and actors and all of that. So we have to discuss this. And also changing the, the narrative around refugees from people who just need help to actually people who bring assets, who actually bring a narrative of uh, hope uh, with them. Um, uh, uh, so this is, uh, I would argue, is the global health minimal, is to be able to, to look at these uh, dimensions um, and rephrase uh, or extend. In some cases, it's not necessarily that we, we need a different ag agenda, it's just that we need to extend uh, the, the current agenda. In some as other aspects, I would argue, as proposed here, that we actually need to rethink the agenda and reframe the question and that becomes a new global health minimal. This is what we are uh, in, um, in uh, academic global health, the production of new ideas that will then inform research, rethinking, and, uh, and policy. Now, um, what, what this slide is, tr uh, is trying to say is that uh, today, um, uh, 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 it's very unfortunate that we have this slide. It's really a terrible slide that shows that the story has built up over time and we are not necessarily at a much better place than we were last year in terms of the, uh, the people in need. So um, we should not be facing these crises. I mean, we have got to re rethink an order that allows this uh, to, uh, to happen particularly global order, but it has huge implications for humanitarian work, and we cannot be uh, only in the uh, receiving uh, side. Um, uh, 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 this is the slide that, uh, that needs to make the case that, that the what is the so-called global refugee crisis is primarily, uh, a primarily a regional crisis inside Syria as well as in neighboring countries. That aspect uh, needs to be uh, emphasized. And if you look at where the where um, uh, where um, uh, refugees are hosted now, taking again the refugee as a case study, you see that they're mostly um, uh, really based in uh, in uh, in, uh, in our region, um, the uh, meaning the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, 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 Southern European uh, region or surrounding region. So we have got to, um, to think about some of these questions. If I may um, have perhaps uh, three minutes of the, um, 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 uh, the video. We're going to show a video from, uh, from a Syrian health worker. So we, um, if, I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fadi Haladi. I'm neurosurgeon from Damascus. I left Syria in 2013 when I was in the fourth year doing my residency in neurosurgery. The situation inside Syria before 2011 was so terrible also before the crisis that all the admission office was related to the security forces inside Syria. That means every patient entered to the hospital get all information to this admin office. After 2011, we found, me and our colleague, that it's so important to involve ourselves in treating all the wounded and all the injuries coming from demonstration or any conflict. That was so difficult to deal this issue under control of regime. 
So we created a, a network from Syrian doctor called Free Union of Syrian Doctor. That until now, it's implementation body for some project inside Ruta, Eastern Ruta. So it's so important was to create this network to do rapid response in some events or in some emergency cases and doing some task for this network. After I left uh, Syria to Lebanon in 2013, I was also so difficulties to work in Lebanon that the Syrian doctor don't allow to work at all for legal status and don't uh, getting a permission for work. So even though that you found a lot of cases needed to help from primary health care to secondary health care from the Syrian refugees. So also I have good experience when I found and I was with my some of my colleagues were founder for the initiative called MAPS. MAPS now in Lebanon have at least 320 employees, all of them Syrian. That's very good idea to organize health worker, Syrian health worker inside Lebanon. Because in general, it's so difficult and so challenge to do the balance between you can go to the Europe, legal issue or legal uh, ways or illegal ways, or you stay in uh, Lebanon with Nippon, in the Nippon country to the Syria to help and serve Syrian refugees. So for this balance was so difficult for the Syrian health workers. So what we did in MAPS and we are doing now to create a magnetic and organized body for the Syrian health worker. So we have now three centers, one of them for primary health care, the second for rehabilitation and physical rehabilitation, the third one for specialist clinic. And all the staff are Syrian. And I, also I have another experimental issue uh, in Arsal. We can, we can and stop I the want video. also to share We can stop the video. Arsal, okay. it's... All right. So, um, uh, so we took the, the, uh, the, uh, the example of the refugees as a subject that, uh, that uh, allows us to revisit uh, the t uh, some of the tenets of, uh, of, uh, of global discussion in global health and academic global health uh, uh, about humanitarian emergencies. And the second example would be, um, uh, would be the health workers. And we have a testimonial from one of our uh, colleagues who was displaced um, um, actually under terrible conditions. Uh, um, he did not uh, uh, voice that under ter terrible conditions that he and some of his colleagues uh, were under. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, but the subject of attacks on health, uh, uh, on health workers was actually um, uh, uh, discussed at length in the, first, uh, in the first day. I hope some of you attended this. So I'll perhaps uh, uh, revisit this uh, uh, to emphasize some of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the important lessons of that example. Um, the first uh, uh, Syrian doctor to actually uh, be targeted in the Syrian conflict um, um, was this, uh, this, uh, this colleague, uh, Dr. Ali, who was killed in March 2011. We're talking here within the first three weeks of the onset of the crisis. And it was uh, also in 2011 that actually uh, Amnesty started uh, documenting attacks, not just on health workers and facilities, but attacks on patients in sites who are injured in demonstrations and, uh, uh, and otherwise inside uh, healthcare facilities. So that, that uh, early telling sign uh, was there uh, documented. This case was actually the case of this uh, killing was documented by Reuters in 2011. If you uh, pick up a, a, a one of the Reuters uh, um, uh, report. So, so we have uh, uh, early telling sign very early in the context of the development of this uh, crisis um, clear indication that this is going to be a problem. Now fast forward 
a few years uh, later on, and this is the work that, uh, that uh, we have done through the commission, early product of the commission. Now we're talking about, about a full scale use of targeting of healthcare uh, workers and facilities as a, as a strategy of war. This is what in action on the early telling sign of a crisis can get you, can get us in this, uh, in, in this and other crises. And where the Syria crisis has been uh, uh, game changing is that when this is allowed to go on for so long uh, and become what uh, human um, rights organizations describe as a, uh, as a um, war crime strategy, this strategy of committing war crime as a way of winning the war, then in this case, um, the implications uh, go far, far beyond Syria. And uh, uh, what the Lancet developed is actually developed a, uh, a, uh, an infographic that, that describes the weaponization um, uh, from targeting workers, killing them, to attacking facilities, to criminalizing medical neutrality. I mean, this is, um, um, this is not the first case of, uh, of a government passing a law criminalizing provision of aid to, uh, to uh, those wounded in demonstrations and otherwise. But it is, um, um, it is yet uh, another indication that inaction uh, can get us to, uh, to a worse shape. Um, taking out um, essential medicines and surgical supply from uh, aid uh, that goes to besieged areas. And obviously really committing this as a war crime strategy but also eventually really depriving people of access to healthcare. And, uh, and, and we know that access to services and basic goods has been a driving force uh, of getting people to move from the communities where they live. So the implications are, uh, are, uh, are really profound. And uh, what this slide uh, uh, tries to show is the, uh, um, is the number of, uh, of health workers uh, um, killed over uh, the six years of the crisis. Uh, um, by th these are very uh, conservative estimates, mostly based on uh, Physician for Human Rights estimates, which use a three-way, three-point co uh, corroboration strategy, which is really very, very um, uh, demanding for a conflict like this. But what's really striking here is that the repeated attacks on health facilities. So what we can see from this slide is that some of the health facilities has been repeatedly targeted with the intention to shut down. Um, so what we have, uh, through our review, we have made a, a blank statement that this is actually, this pattern has not been seen in any previous war. Um, um, we have um, obviously had to conclude a few policy options about how to use this. And this is where uh, this has become then core to global, uh, uh, to global health. From, uh, from the issue of monitoring to the situation, to actually building the capacity of people like Fadi, who had had his uh, neurosurgery interrupted, the residency he had to flee the war, um, building their capacity so they become a lifeline back to rebuilding the health system uh, when the time comes, or they are allowed to find some way of practice in order to, for them not to lose their, uh, their skills, to um, uh, uh, advancing solidarity. I mean, Len and colleagues have led uh, important work on safeguarding health in, in conflict and uh, uh, ICRC's work on healthcare in danger, all of these uh, um, is um, what these uh, what these um, uh, uh, um, uh, initiatives show is that there are innovations in global health, including in an academic global health. But the global solidarity, so to speak, um, um, uh, to, uh, to really protect health, considering the escalating nature of this, of this crisis, um, uh, uh, leaves much to be desired. So, um, uh, the uh, issue of uh, uh, health workers in uh, uh, refugee health workers, such as Fadi, in host countries, also need, needs rethinking. A lot of the discussion today takes place on 
the host countries, the needs of host countries, how they can manage all of this. But also this needs to be thought about in relation to the longer term strategy of rebuilding the health system in Syria and allowing these doctors uh, and other health workers to return. If that component is not considered, and right now it's not well considered in global health, this will not happen. So um, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the, um, um, uh, uh, the core team of the commission and our commissioners, uh, Paul included, and others for allowing us to, to talk with you about this subject. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, as Paul mentioned, my name is Chris Hilbrunner. I'm the Deputy Chief of Party with CUSENET, which is the Famine Early Warning Systems Network. Chris, just say that. Yeah. Um, so there's a few things I'd like to talk about today. And in some ways, I'm coming at this from a little bit of a different perspective than my colleagues coming from food security uh, side of the field. But I think, as I've listened to my colleagues talk to you this afternoon, I think there are some uh, clear common themes uh, across the three of us that will be interesting to highlight. So I'd like to start by touching briefly on what FuseNet does, for those of you who are less familiar, talk about some of the tools that we use to talk about acute food insecurity and famine risk. Um, then spend a little bit of time looking at the state of the world and what we're expecting in 2017 in terms of food security and famine and talk a little bit about some of the key drivers and then end with a few points of discussion um, that I think are both operationally relevant but also <clears throat> relevant to you as uh, students and faculty and, and academics. So very briefly, uh, FuseNet is a USAID-funded project that started in 1985 in the aftermath of a famine in the Sahel. Um, so we've been going for about 32 years, and our primary role is to provide early warning of food security emergencies six to 12 months in advance so that uh, response agencies have the time to scale up, plan response, and implement response in a way that protects livelihoods, and saves lives. We currently cover about 35 countries, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also Central Asia, the Caribbean, and Latin America. And we have a variety of staff in the United States, but then also 25 offices around the world where we work with a variety of partners, national governments, the UN, NGOs, et cetera. So, um, the first thing I'd like to touch on is some of the tools that we use, and I think this is both helpful background for some of the later discussion about what we're expecting in 2017, um, <clears throat> but also, I think, fodder for an interesting discussion about the tools that we use to communicate our analysis, and I think some of the implications for non-food sectors of the tools that we've developed to talk about acute food insecurity. So um, I'm not sure some of you may be familiar with the IPC. This is the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification. Uh, it's been around now for about 15 years, but the most recent version came out in 2012. And the idea here was sort of twofold. First, and I think most importantly, the IPC provides us with a common language to talk about the severity of acute food insecurity. So when someone says there's a food security crisis, in the past when someone said there's a food security crisis, it was unclear what that meant. If I said it was a crisis and you said it was an emergency and someone else said it was a disaster, were we actually seeing the situation in the same way or, and just using different words or did we have a fundamentally different impression of what was going on? So the IPC gave us that common language. You know, this is a very simplified, set of definitions, but there's a whole reference table and a whole manual that describes what each of these phases are, what are the key indicators that we use, et cetera. 
Um, so this, in addition to the common language, the IPC provides a framework to use a wide range of information for analysis. So the idea is not to get stuck on you know, one specific indicator, but to take the full range of available information, pull that together, and then use that to do a convergence analysis that tells us what's going on. So there are five phases going from phase one minimal to phase five famine, and uh, urgent humanitarian action is needed for populations or areas at phase three or higher. So in the context of 2017, there's been a lot of discussion about famine and famine risk. <clears throat> so we have four countries in 2017 where either famine has been declared or there is a credible risk that famine could occur. Uh, so Ni Northern Nigeria, South Sudan, Somalia, and Yemen. And so under the IPC, there's a very specific definition of famine. There are three criteria that have to be um, so at least 20% of households have to be facing extreme food gaps, even with the employment of all coping strategies. The global acute malnutrition prevalence has to be above 30%, and the non-trauma uh, mortality rate has to be above 2 per 10,000 per day. So I highlight this both because we're going to be talking about famine risk in a couple of countries in the next couple slides. It's also a good example of some of the criteria that have been developed as part of the IPC. Um, but I think it's also, just as a little bit of an aside, interesting to note um, that while in the public sphere, in the last two or three years, particularly since the uh, Somalia famine in 2011, this definition has been taken up uh, very broadly. So anytime you read it, article in the New York Times or in another place about famine, these, this definition is highlighted. But it has been and remains, uh, on a technical level, somewhat controversial. And there's kind of an ongoing debate about there's a camp that thinks these thresholds are too high and that we should make it much easier to declare a famine because famine you know, catalyzes response. And there's another group that says these thresholds are way too low and that we should make it much harder. So <clears throat> just as a little bit of an aside, I think this has been a successful initiative, but there's still quite a bit of debate um, kind of behind the scenes that ends up playing itself out in some of the emergencies we're seeing. So let's take this and talk about it in the context of what we're seeing in 2017. So this map, uh, which was produced by FuseNet, highlights the size of the food insecure population. Uh, the peak needs during, we use a fiscal year, but in 2017. And so the size of the bubble is uh, aligned with the size of the population. So we go you know, at a high point from Yemen, where there's more than 10 million people who need emergency food assistance this year all the way down to some of the countries in the Sahel, like Mauritania and, and Mali, where those numbers are much smaller. What is unprecedented about this year is two things. First, at a global level, there's roughly 70 million people who need emergency food assistance during 2017. This is about 40% higher than a comparable number in 2015. So the scale of needs is enormous. And again, this is, I think, one of the common themes that uh, was brought up earlier in this panel was just the sheer number of people who need assistance in 2017 and into the future is enormous. The other thing is the famine risk in multiple countries. So certainly in the last 20 years, there have been famines that have occurred, and there have been places where the risk of famine has been elevated. But to have four countries where there's a credible risk of famine, you know, and these aren't even adjacent countries, these are, you know, spread across a wide geographic area. So to have this combination of magnitude and severity is something we really haven't seen in the last 20 years. So why, why are we seeing this? So the first thing, and again, this is another, I think, point of overlap with some of the earlier discussions, was the persistence of conflict. 
and the role that that plays both in as a direct cause in terms of interrupting livelihoods, uh, displacing people, but also the impact it has on humanitarian response and the relationship between conflict and lack of humanitarian access. And this is critical because, you know, in 2017, the humanitarian community, uh, you know, has, has the tools and the ability to present, to prevent loss of life when they have access to these areas. And so, and the information systems we now have and you know, the satellite imagery and the surveillance systems, we know what's going on in most parts of the world and if response can happen, many of these emergencies can be mitigated. But it's in these places where conflict is preventing humanitarian access and preventing data collection where the real risk of famine persists. And so you can see, uh, this is data from a group called ACLED that monitors conflict incidents um, in Africa, and actually they've now moved into large parts of Asia as well. And they've been monitoring this for many years. And so on the, on the left, you can see this increasing trend in a whole variety of types of conflict. So whether it's violence against civilians, whether this is remote violence, so this would be um, drone attacks or IEDs, or whether it's sort of more traditional battles. Um, and then you can see in the map for 2016 how these are dispersed spatially. And you know, there's a, a pattern here when we talk about famine risk and where we see this overlap. So Somalia, South Sudan, Northeast Nigeria. Again, many of these places where conflict is preventing humanitarian access is where this risk of famine is particularly high. The other theme is drought. And um, this map looks at a one-year period from March of 2015 to February of 2016. And it compares the level of dryness during that 12-month period to a 30-year climatological record from 1981 through 2016. And the areas that are colored here, either red or brown, are areas that had either the most severe, the driest year, the second driest year, or the third driest year in the past 30 years. And you can see that there's quite a bit of red on this map. In fact, 13% of the uh, globe's land mass um, faced severe drought during this year. And if we go back 30 years, this is the highest prevalence of drought in the 30-year climate record. So we had these very severe droughts, which some of you may be familiar with, a very severe drought in Ethiopia, a very severe drought in Southern Africa, severe droughts in Southeast Asia, a very severe drought in Central America and Haiti. So really uh, extreme events. And the thing to highlight here is that it's not so much that the, the frequency of drought or the frequency of low rainfall is increasing, but what's happening is that when droughts occur, they're more severe than they used to be. And there's sort of two, two key reasons. The first is that, uh, so you've probably heard of El Ninos and La Ninas, so these are ENSO events. These ENSO events are, when they occur, they are stronger than they used to be. So for example, the El Nino that happened in 2015 was the strongest El Nino in recorded history. So these ENSO events are much stronger than they used to be, and they drive out in many key parts of the world. At the same time, because of climate change, air surface temperatures are much higher than they used to be, and those hot temperatures amplify those droughts that do occur. So a drought that in the past may have been only moderate, you know, that same lack of rainfall in combination with these much hotter temperatures now has a much more substantial effect on crops, on livestock, on access to water. So again, there's many other things driving um, what we're seeing in terms of food insecurity in 2017, but I think these are the two key themes that seem to be having the largest impact. 
So I will uh, sort of leave you with a few thoughts or a few questions. I think these are both interesting operational questions that we face at FuseNet, but I also think are interesting questions for you both as practitioners, but also as um, academics and students and faculty. So the first thing that I'll highlight is that one of the things that I've observed is that as we have more data, this sounds may sound surprising, but as we have more data, in some context that's taken as that there's less need for analysis. You know, I've figured out the perfect indicator. I'm gonna go do this survey, I'm gonna look at this indicator, and now I know exactly what's going on. And there are a number of cases that I've seen in terms of food security analysis where this focus on a specific indicator, you sort of miss the forest for the trees. There's this rich set of other information, some of it maybe not quantitative survey data, but a whole range of other information that should really be incorporated and considered as part of the analysis that gets left behind because I have this piece of data. And I think over the 10 years that I've been at FuseNet, there's more and more data available, and so this happens more frequently. So as analysts, I would encourage you not to fall into that trap. And as students and teachers, I would encourage you to develop those analytical skills that allow you to pull that wide range of information together and don't get too caught up in the silver bullet indicator. Um, the second thing is, do non-food sectors need better decision support tools? So I mentioned the IPC. This is a tool that was very specifically designed to help us do decision support. How do we take complicated food security analysis and communicate with decision makers in a very clear and concise way? I think it's been very successful in that. And what I might say to this group is that maybe it's been successful sometimes at the expense of other sectors. Because many, what I've seen is because we have this common language that's been widely accepted, because we have these maps, because we have these sort of this common way of talking about it, it's very easy to frame emergencies as a food security emergency. And sometimes that makes sense, and sometimes there's really a more complex, multi-sectoral uh, richness that gets lost. So for example, and you know, this was mentioned earlier, in the Horn of Africa right now, there has certainly been a very severe drought. There are certainly food security concerns. Somalia is an area where we are concerned about famine. But the major issue, or a major issue, is cholera. The cholera outbreak in South Central Somalia, the cholera outbreak in Southern Ethiopia, and I, from my perspective, some of that is getting lost, and there's so much focus on sort of what's the food security analysis and is there gonna be a famine that some of this, this framing around food security can end up affecting other sectors. And so the question is, how do other sectors, it's, I don't know that we need an IPC for every other sector out there, but how do we make sure to present the complexity and the multi-sectoral nature of many of these emergencies in an effective way? Um, I think there's still a question about whether we always allocate our resources based on evidence. Um, we have very scarce resources against a huge amount of need. And while I think we've come a long way in terms of using evidence to inform how we allocate those resources, I still think there's a lot of room for continued improvement. As an example, and I don't want to pick on, the, on West Africa, but in the last five years, the international community has spent $2 billion on emergency food aid in the Sahel. This is more than every other emergency in the world, except for Syria and South Sudan, except that there hasn't been a food security emergency in the Sahel in the last five years. So is that really the place, is that really where the evidence is telling us that these resources should go? And then the last point is, 
when we are responding, how do we better develop and socialize <coughs> no regrets response? And this was something that came out of the 2011 Somalia famine. One of the issues with the discussion about famine that I think is very frustrating is that there is a tendency on the part of some donors and some implementing agencies to really focus on whether or not we're gonna declare famine. What's the definition? Is there a famine coming? And people wait until they hold back resources and they hold back sort of going all in on a response until that famine declaration comes. Uh, this is a mistake and you know, anytime you wait for a famine to be declared, you're going to be responding too late. And so after 2011, there's been some movement towards this idea of no regrets response, which is the idea that if there's a risk of these extreme outcomes in the future, what is a package of responses that we could implement now um, that there won't be, if, even if the famine doesn't happen, there isn't regret that we spent that money because it's gonna have these positive impacts. But how do we turn sort of that great idea into something operational and how do we implement that at scale? Because looking at the famine risk right now in these countries, this isn't happening to the degree that it needs to. So I think there was a comment earlier on some of the low levels of funding. You know, if you look at Yemen, um, if you look at you know, Northeast Nigeria and Somalia, you know, we're not responding to the degree that we should. And at least part of that is a little bit of a waiting game to see if a famine declaration really happens. So, and again, I think this is a, a major operational need, but I think it's also something where you, as students and faculty and universities can help in helping to identify what are these early responses, which ones work the best, how do we bring these things to scale, I think that would be a major contribution. So I will stop there and hand it back to Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a couple comments from my side, and then I hope that you'll all be thinking of questions as I'm speaking or as the colleagues have been speaking, and there are microphones at the back, uh, or sorry, midway. Um, but please take advantage because I think you've got the, the right people up here uh, on the podium to ask some of your questions. Just some thoughts because, as I mentioned, the last eight months, um, I've now been at, at Johns Hopkins, but the last 14 years I was within the UN system at UNHCR. And a couple of thoughts, which are maybe controversial, but perhaps not, is that certainly there's not enough money right now um, in, in the response. But there's a lot of questions, how is the system, the humanitarian system, functioning? Even with the money that it has, I believe strongly that we can do a lot better with what we have, and that there's a tremendous amount, way a wastage, too much process, um, probably too much money going through international agencies, better ways to integrate systems. So there's a tremendous amount that I think could be changed in the humanitarian system. But the interesting thing also now, and I'm cautious because I, Dean of Nursing at Hopkins is in the audience here, but not to criticize academia, but also, and, and Rick said this, and I strongly believe that in the humanitarian system, however, I won't say it dysfunctional, but it could be improved, there has been a lot of thought of how to actually change. And, um, taken a lot of effort and, and brains to think about this. But in the academic world, I don't think we've had sufficiently dealt with in the human, how in the academic world should we be thinking about training humanitarian, future humanitarian workers. And in many situations where um, funding for the, human, for the academia and, uh, and article publishing is what really counts, how do the academics actually get into the field to do this stuff to be able to know what's going on? I think if you've been in, uh, not in the field and been operational, I think it's extremely difficult to know how to train uh, future humanitarians. How do you deal with, with 11 month MPH programs where it's all packed? How can you actually deal with some of these operational issues and do different types of training? So there's a tremendous amount of challenges that I see within the academic world and how we have to change to be able to adequately, adequately um, train future humanitarian workers. So with that, I'd like to open up and I see 
there we'll start. And please, what I would say is, I think what we'll do is we'll take three to four questions and then we'll um, allow the colleagues to answer. Please introduce your, your, uh, with your name and where you're from. Hi there, my name is Liza Halcom. I'm an emergency medicine physician and a medical toxicologist who is from Washington University in St. Louis and also I work for Monsanto. I would like to posit that we actually have a solution for drought in terms of famine. Uh, there, and we also have a, a, a lot of uh, technology available to help people who are in food insecure situations to uh, avoid those. And one of those things, one of the important things about food aid is, is you cannot uh, just dump a whole bunch of food on the market and uh, then deprive African farmers of making money on that. So the technology is actually out there in the terms of GMO. So for right now, in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, there's an armyworm infestation, which has knocked out about 80% of the crops. So outside of the Horn of Africa, we're looking at a big, huge risk of famine uh, in their maize because, because of their inability to preserve the maize population. And they've actually sprayed a whole bunch of insecticide all over it, and everybody gets all wound up about insecticides, understandably. If they had GMO technology, in BT corn, they wouldn't have this problem. And this could be a solution where the farmers could actually have the corn, plant it, make their own money, and protect it against pests. Um, but there's been so much hype about GMO internationally and so much resistance to the uh, adoption of this technology that it really puts uh, people in at-risk situations uh, in a really uh, difficult situation. So, for example, in 2002, when Zambia declared famine and 14 million people were starving. Just if you could wrap it up quickly. I will, just a second. Uh, 14 million people were starving. The president of the country would not take food aid from the United States because it was GMO. And his concern was that he was going to disrupt trade relationships with Europe. In the meantime, the Europeans were feeding their livestock GMO while 14 million people starved. I think there needs to be a reset in the discussion about the role of GMO in preventing famine. One percent of our farmers farm in the United States. Okay, we feed I think everybody. We, uh, we've got it. Thank you. And, and we export 23 percent of what we make. Thank you. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Naoko Kozuki. I'm a health research advisor at the International Rescue Committee. Uh, our health unit specifically has a research team because we believe implementing agencies have a role in evidence generation as well. Uh, I specifically work in the MNCH field and it's very clear that the key MNCH research donors are not very prominent in humanitarian sector or are completely missing in the humanitarian sector. And I was wondering if you have any tips on communicating with these key research donors uh, who are not humanitarian specific and convincing them that this field really needs more research and despite the risk adversity, despite the expense, that we really should be getting more money in this field for research. And one more and then we'll, we'll take around. Oh, hi, thank you to the panel. My name is Sonia Stokes. I am an International Emergency Medicine Fellow at Columbia University. It was mentioned that global solidarity is crucial in achieving the protection of healthcare workers and health institutions in conflict settings, and I completely agree with this. My concern is that in relying on WHO policies, academic institutions or governmental agencies as the main platform for driving or supporting these protections, that we may be participating in further polarizing them so that protection of healthcare workers is perceived as being part of a Western agenda. The possible analogy I see is women's rights in Afghanistan. So my question to the panel is, do you see this as being a potential risk? And if so, what are some ways that we can avoid this? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we'll, we'll please stay there. We're just gonna answer a couple. We'll start with Chris with the GMO. And the Thanks. Um, 
Yes, this is also always a very difficult uh, question. And I think as someone focused on sort of the early warning side of things, I'm probably not best placed to talk about sort of different national government policies on this. I think we tend to take those national government policies as one input in looking at how we anticipate food insecurity is expected to evolve. And as you point out, uh, the issue of GMO remains quite a hot button issue in these countries and does have a big impact on the kind of response that can then be provided. Um, so I think I'd have to leave it there. So uh, thank you for the uh, last uh, intervention. Um, I am not sure I uh, gave the message that uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are proposing the protection through a WHO framework. I did not think so. Um, I actually, what I advocated for is that there are many policy op options for, for protection and uh, solidarity um, uh, is, um, um, uh, is a wished for um, uh, goal uh, for protection of health workers, uh, uh, building on current initiatives that are actually not WHO initiatives. I mean, the, the safeguarding health in, uh, in conflicts is a consortium. The uh, healthcare in danger is an ICRC one. Uh, uh, WHO has an important role to play with regards to um, uh, to uh, advocacy, to documentation, to monitoring, and so uh, there's a lot there. Um, but um, um, uh, I don't think I. Uh yeah. Um, so thanks for the, the comment on the uh, on research around maternal child health. Um, in, in terms of advocating with uh, donors in that area, I, I mean, I think it, I, perhaps it's just to take the evidence to them and uh, demonstrate some of the effectiveness of interventions to date. So um, IRC itself has done, I think, a lot of good uh, studies and has had effective programs. You can demonstrate that a lot of the countries in which humanitarian agencies like IRC and the agencies we've worked for here work and have the highest, as, as I said before, have the highest maternal and, chi and child mortality rates in the world. There's been a lot of effective uh, interventions with community-based uh, treatment of common childhood infections and so on. So, I, I, you know, I think let the data, let the evidence speak for itself and, uh, and, and, and demonstrate the effectiveness of some of your, your trial, trial projects. And I think that that, uh, that may be one way to get uh, the donors on board that, uh, you know, we would be help, we'd be willing to help with uh, that type of advocacy as well. And, uh, you know, as, as Samir has said, you know, it's not WHO policies that are driving work on uh, attack on attacks on healthcare. I think that not only do we have to, um, you know, improve our work on the evidence on these attacks, uh, ensure that we do strong advocacy to prevent those attacks, but I think we've also got to do more analysis of what works uh, to prevent and mitigate uh, the effects of those types of attacks as well and trying to identify some of the best practices and some of the work done in, in Syria has just been tremendous on this as well. And that's a body of work that our organization is doing uh, together with partners right now. Um, perhaps what you were getting at also is that the idea of a Western construct and how uh, and there's a question of human rights, the universal universality of human rights. So attacking healthcare workers, uh, SGBV, but how we, when we have a top-down approach, because you mentioned Afghanistan in certain areas versus working with the community does clearly remain a challenge. But um, I think most people would say with the university, universality of human rights, even though that may be contested by certain governments, um, so it's rather more how to implement these programs from a community level. And maybe just with the research to add is that Syria has, Syria has changed a tremendous amount. It's very interesting. And one of the reasons, I think, is because it's a middle-income country and the, where the refugees are uh, going to middle-income countries as well. But it's also the amount of people in Lebanon when you have one in four being refugees. So there is a change. And Rick had men mentioned the humanitarian development nexus. So some donors that were less interested in maternal child health 
um, whether it be in, in humanitarian emergencies, whether it be Gates, whether it be the Global Fund, have actually made significant changes in the, in, in the last while, uh, and I think part of that is due to Syria. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Megan Gallagher. I am a doctoral candidate at Johns Hopkins, and I work on the emergency health team at Save the Children. Um, something that I heard from different angles um, was this idea of training, um, humanitarian training, and how we keep people working in the humanitarian sector. And I think something that was really absent from the conversation is the topic of gender. Um, I did my master's training in humanitarian emergencies, and 80% of my cohort were female. Um, and 10 years later, I think most people are not working in the humanitarian sector, and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that when you are in the field, there is unequal treatment for men and women, security risks are higher, um, and I don't think that gets acknowledged quite often enough. And then I also think that gender has a role in the research that we do. It has a role in terms of who we can have in the field as staff. We have a really hard time um, maintaining women in our workforce, in our program that we're doing in nine different humanitarian sectors or settings. Um, so I guess I would just like to hear a little bit um, about your thoughts around this. Um, in terms of training, in terms of implementation, and ways that we can keep females in this sector that historically has been challenging, um, especially when the bulk of women being, or bulk of people being trained are women. As you can see, we took that gender diversity <laughs> into the panel that you have in front of you. Yeah, Russell Andrews with the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. Um, many of you may know that uh, following the uh, 2010 Haiti earthquake, uh, it was estimated that 20,000 people died each day due to lack of basic surgical facilities. So several of my colleagues have been thinking of adopting the stroke and trauma center model to disaster response. And we're hopefully going to be able to set up a couple of uh, sites in northern Chile for Latin America and northern Pakistan for Central Asia. Uh, my question is, how would you see a group like this, which actually integrates with the ongoing healthcare system, interact with the organizations that come on the scene in a disaster a week later, like the UN, the WHO? Uh, how could that be productively integrated? Thanks. Please. Hi, um, my name is Taylor Audison. I'm a medical student at Yale University. And um, I appreciate the words that you guys have been giving. My question is, um, I appreciate that you also acknowledge some of the flaws that we have in academia as we're trying to progress our own careers at sometimes the expense of those that we're trying to help. And I was wondering if you could talk about maybe one or two actual deliverables that we could take home, that academia as a whole, but that we could take home that could help to fight maybe some of these um, things that are coming on that are making it difficult for us to actually achieve our goals of helping the people we're studying. Hi, my name is uh, Amit Mistry with the National Institutes of Health. I, I was curious if you could talk a bit more about the types of research where you see a real, a real need for more of the health research, academic community to pay more attention. You mentioned oper operation, uh, operational research, but uh, what are some of the big areas where you see there's a, a huge need or a large need for research intervention, research implementation science, and that sort of thing? Thanks. Okay, why don't we answer uh, those? And then I see there's even a, um, on the phone, there's a, a question. So why don't we start with, can I start with you, Rick, on some of these questions? Um, so uh, the gender issue, that's, um, that's a good challenge to us. And I, 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 I certainly un understand that issue as, as um, so, many of, uh, so many of the staff that I worked, started with uh, were women. And in fact, uh, when I worked um, at IRC, uh, I think, uh, a large proportion of, of, of the staff there, uh, of the director level staff, were, were women. But as you went up higher in other systems, uh, such as the UN system, women don't figure as prominently. So if, you, if we look across the globe right now for humanitarian coordinators, for those of you who aren't so familiar with the, humanita the international humanitarian system, the senior humanitarian staff member for the UN system in a country is called the humanitarian coordinator, and very few of them are women. So. Uh, 
I, I think it is important that we develop our training programs, our career paths, and um, our support structures so that they are uh, more friendly and supportive of, of, of gender balance. And I, I think that uh, this requires a dialogue to see what are the obstacles. Um, and you touched on some of them, the security issues, uh, some of the, the personal pressures. Um, but I, I, think it's a, I think it's an excellent point. Um, I think at the lower levels, there's a lot of women represented, but as you go up the system, particularly in the UN system, there's a significant underrepresentation, and I think that's to our, uh, uh, our disadvantage. And I, I, you know, there's certainly a need for, for, for more dialogue on that. Um, the point you made, Russ, uh, so did, did I hear you say like a, a hub and spoke type system with, what was the, you, you talked about setting up surgical facilities in vulnerable places and then how, how that might fit in with international teams coming in? Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's a big initiative, as, as you may be well aware, called the Emergency Medical Teams Initiative, and and that's uh, it's based very much on the work that's done been done on international search and rescue teams. So um, it's a it's a it's a program run out of WHO where um, we are identifying, um, verifying emergency medical teams, which are self-sufficient clinical teams that can deploy within the first 24, 48 hours, particularly for, to provide clinical, and you know, including trauma and surgical care, in, uh, particularly in response to sudden onset disasters. Um, and it's, it's a system that's, that's rapidly evolving. Uh, I think it's proven itself already um, with the, the Philippine cyclone uh, and um, the, uh, the Nepal earthquake, uh, even, uh, uh, cycle, Hurricane Winston in, in Fiji a couple of years ago. So, um, and there's a process now to verify what are called, there's, there's a classification system for these emergency medical teams. Type ones are outpatient care, type two are surgical care, type three is specialist care. Um, so that, I think that's a model that, that would, uh, would work well with the type of concept you're, you're discussing. Oh, okay. Um, and then academia, what are some of the deliverables and what, what are some of the operational research ideas? I think um, operational research, I think particularly in the protracted emergencies, how do you develop sustainable delivery of health services when you don't have good governance um, in, in, in a health system, when a, a Ministry of Health is dysfunctional or unwilling? Um, what, are the, what, are the f what are the foundational elements that you need to put down in a health system in the remote areas to provide some level of sustainability. I think there's a lot of operational research that needs to be done about that. What, what are those key building blocks of a, of a uh, found, found, the foundational building blocks of a functional health system in an incredibly resource poor environment? And I think, uh, you know, some of the deliverables, I, I think for, for, uh, for students looking into this field, uh, career paths and looking at what are the essential trainings that are required in a university sitting and keeping it really operational, uh, uh, moving beyond the theory. I mean, there's a lot more I could say about that, but time's against us. We will just go the last two to Samer and then Chris, relatively quick, because we will have to stop and for the closing. Uh, so on the surgical um, uh, uh, issue, um, this is really important, but it falls on their supply side. Now, in the, uh, in the uh, violent conflict-related settings, such as Syria, it's quite clear it doesn't work. The, the major issue there, the demand side, is that now you have um, medical students, uh, the experienced professionals have left, the medical students or veterinary students or second year medical students are the ones facing an open belly and or uh, complex fractures or this and that, and the question is how to support them in this, and this brings up a clear deliverable for global health and, and for academia. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to go through it in detail. Uh, so two brief comments on research. One in the context of the initial question on gender, um, just sort of an interesting experience we've had in the last year. We've been using some secondary data from the World Bank's LSMS survey <clears throat> to look at livelihoods in Nigeria. And there was a great interest in 
better exploring the gender dimensions of livelihood patterns and food insecurity in this work because this is something we haven't done all that well in the past. And so the people we hired to work on this actually had a gender, uh, had some gender analysis background. And the challenge we've had is that the indicators and the data was collected don't really allow us to dig into that issue. So I think one of the things is making sure that when we make these big investments in large data sets that then may be used by many people, how do we make sure that the kind of information we need to do uh, to look at the gender lens is, is well incorporated. The other thing briefly on the question about <coughs> kinds of research, I mean, this is obviously coming from the kind of work I do, but uh, nutrition causal analysis. We have a very clear conceptual picture of what causes acute malnutrition and very little rigorous analysis from the field about what is driving acute malnutrition in specific cases. And the risk, and this is something we've seen a lot in the Sahel, is that that means that persistently high prevalence of acute malnutrition uh, is labeled a food crisis and food aid is delivered. And so that's maybe one area of focus that I think could be very interesting. I want to thank all of you and the, the, nearly the end of a conference on a beautiful sunny day in Washington. So thank you for coming and thank you for the speakers.